Shalom from Jerusalem. This is TV7's Israel at War update. And as we're set to deliberate the latest developments here in Israel, throughout the region and beyond, it's always important to remember how this war began. 336 days ago, the Islamist terror group Hamas, as well as is its affiliates in the Gaza Strip, have launched a surprise onslaught on southern Israel, declaring war by perpetrating a massacre, murdering some 1,200 mostly civilians, wounding over 4,800 others, and kidnapping 246 people, including elderly men, women, children, and infants, 101 of them remain in Hamas captivity to date. Subsequently, on the 8th of October of last year, Iran practically joined this war by greenlighting its proxy in Lebanon, Hezbollah, to launch cross-border attacks against Israel. Since then, Hezbollah has launched thousands of rockets from Lebanon towards Israel, and it has also been joined by additional Iranian proxies from Syria, Iraq, Yemen, including from Iran proper, which launched a direct attack on the night between the 13th and 14th of April earlier this year. Let's now turn to our TV7 editor at large, Mr. Amir Oren. Amir, if I may start by focusing initially on Judea and Samaria, Operation Summer Camps, as the IDF dubbed it, uh, has come to a respite or a close after a week and a half, uh, targeting specifically uh, terror elements within the city of Janine. What can you tell us about that? So indeed, uh, the IDF um, has uh, reported that uh, after these 10 days, uh, the operation is deemed successful with uh, taking out uh, several senior commanders, especially of Hamas and especially uh, at the Jenin uh, uh, refugee camp and other uh, facilities and uh, hideouts. And that um, a very methodical work uh, has been done and will still uh, be conducted to uproot uh, whatever terror uh, cells are there in the um, infrastructure. Now, no one uh, has any illusion that um, this will have a long standing effect. Uh, work must be done. The problem is that this is drawing to the uh, Judea and Samaria area, the division the there, and to the uh, Jordan Valley where there is a brigade, but uh, maybe they will set up uh, another division. It uh, draws um, much more force than the IDF can spare uh, regarding the other fronts, Gaza where fighting goes on, and Lebanon where a ground campaign could erupt. So while, uh, success um, has indeed uh, been marked there, it's only temporary. Indeed. Let's now turn to central Israel, where we're joined by Colonel and Reserve Miri Eisen, formerly the director of the ICT uh, at Reichman University and uh, a senior officer at the IDF uh, Intelligence Director at It's Good to See You, Miri. I I'd like to ask you particularly, as somebody who served as a full colonel during the Second Intifada and subsequently also as an adv advisor to prime ministers here in Israel, uh, in contending uh, with the various challenges at hand uh, or similar challenges that uh, are now currently in the forefront, uh, what would you recommend Jerusalem to do? Well in the current uh, climate at a time when international pressure, obviously, to end hostilities after so many long months of fighting, also in the Gaza Strip and Lebanon and elsewhere, has been ongoing. There is no easy answer for that. So the first thing is to say there is no easy answer. There's no quick fix. There's no quick solution. And I think that that's one of the things that we need to convey both to the world and inside Israel. It isn't that you make a decision and you decide, you decide, Israel, on your own initiative to pull back and stop fighting against Hamas, against Palestinian Islamic Jihad in the Gaza Strip, and that that will resolve the other fronts. But I want to focus for a moment in continuation to what Amir was describing before to give part of that challenge. Because there's no question that what we're fighting against right now, the senior commanders that we have been attacking in the West Bank, let alone inside um, uh, the Gaza Strip, the age is going down. 
half the population in the in Judea and Samaria of the Palestinian population is under the age of 25. And that means that these terror capabilities that we have to act against, that we need to seed out because they can attack any place, any time otherwise, are very young. And I think that what we need to focus on in that sense in Jerusalem, when we're talking also to the world, is worldwide to talk about the challenge of what is this younger generation listening to, hearing, and believing. And this is a real challenge, which is something that the outside world could do a lot more about, not just us fighting against the physical capabilities that they're bearing, that they're building in their terror capabilities. Indeed. Let's now turn to Washington, D.C., where we're joined by retired Brigadier General Mark Kimmett, formerly an Assistant Secretary of uh, State for Political and Military Affairs, among other, uh, a long list of other positions. It's good to see you, General. Uh, I'd like to ask you particularly, uh, at a time when uh, Israel has accumulated a lot of intelligence, a lot of data about various uh, Iranian-driven activities throughout Judea and Samaria, the Jordan Valley, and... Uh, has the capacity also to provide and share those informations with uh, their counterparts in the United States. Will Washington back Jerusalem to confront those threats, knowing the uh, dire implications uh, if uh, those uh, terror cells uh, are not kept in check? I don't think there's any doubt that uh, the United States, if that saw a direct and proximate cause uh, coming from those elements, would provide, uh, would not provide any level of intelligence support uh, that would be needed. Uh, that seems to be a pretty clear case of uh, a threat to the defense of Israel. Uh, and uh, I think that the United States often argues about uh, the manner and the quantity of support for the defense of Israel proper. Uh, I don't think that there would be any argument in this case. Thank you, General. Let's now turn elsewhere here in Israel, where we're joined by Brigadier General in Reserve, Redik Shafir, formerly an uh, Israeli Air Force commander, an Air Force pilot, uh, and many other positions as well. It's good to see you, General. Uh, I'd like to focus on a, uh, not necessarily a new method, but uh, the uh, increased mandate granted to the IDF and to the discretion, of course, of the Chief of General Staff, uh, Lieutenant General in Reserve, Helzi Alevi, to utilize aerial strikes in uh, Samaria, particularly uh, something that, of course, is in collaboration with uh, Central Command Commander uh, and uh, the Division uh, Commander in uh, the Northern Samaria region. Uh, do you see this as a uh, legitimate necessity, or is this just in order to ensure that you can carry on those activities with a reduced number of men on the ground? Well, obviously, uh, just to mention that uh, General uh, Halevi is, is not in reserve at this time. Um, but uh, yes, seriously, okay. taking your question, um, the, the reason that the Air Force was not part of the uh, uh, fighting the uh, the terrorism in Judea and Samaria was not to create a reason for uh, Hamas in Gaza to fire rockets and to uh, keep a more conventional warfare type. But um, as as uh, we are seeing that Iran is uh, undermining the uh, uh, the area both uh, by activating. Uh, uh, terrorists in Judea and Samaria and by supplying weapons, whether it be it across the uh, Jordan River in some manner uh, or all kinds of uh, other uh, uh, ways and means that we won't specify here, um, the the use of the Air Force makes the uh, activities much uh, quicker, less with less casualties, and obviously uh, less forces needing to uh, take place, secure certain areas, et cetera. So this, uh, so to answer your question, yes, uh, you need fewer people to take care of this, um, much faster reaction, and uh, I would even say more lethal um, um, results. Uh, all these uh, are part and parcel of the war against terror in Judea and Samaria, uh, that does not mean that we're going to see uh, peace and quiet in that area. 
But uh, just to answer your question, yes, uh, the Air Force is taking part mostly with UAVs, but also with uh, attack helicopters. Indeed. Thank you, General uh, Shafir. It's uh, good to note uh, just uh, that uh, during the course of this week and a half, uh, some 14 terror operatives, senior level terror operatives, some of them were eliminated, uh, some 30 other suspected terror operatives were apprehended, and a large number of munitions, underground infrastructure uh, with uh, the uh, various components to uh, create explosives and other aspects uh, were unveiled and as such also destroyed. Uh, Mr. Olin, let's uh, shift gears to the Gaza Strip. What is the current state of play? Uh, we have just undergone a very momentous week uh, with the uh, uh, six captives murdered by uh, Hamas by um, a very intense internal debate regarding the uh, Philadelphia Corridor. And um, Secretary of State Blinken uh, has just uh, said that 90 percent of uh, the hostage deal uh, has been uh, uh, completed. But of course, 90 percent is never complete. And uh, we have to see whether the uh, remaining 10 percent can be negotiated, because if not, we are sure to see um, intensified pressures both on Hamas um, as well as on Israel. Indeed. Uh, Colonel Eisen, I'd like to hear more specifically, there are discussions now on uh, taking away uh, Hamas's capacity from uh, utilizing humanitarian aid in order to continue to effectively govern the Gaza Strip and uh, to basically give it to clans that are affiliated with Hamas and which then go ahead and sell it in uh, inflated prices to the various communities uh, currently in the different humanitarian zones. Uh, Israel is uh, deliberating a, a stark shift into handing over the humanitarian aid directly to the population, which of course will establish many complexities. What can you tell us about that? So here we are, 11 months into this war, almost 12. I mean, we're edging into that year-long time. And we need to remind ourselves that there are over 2 million people who live in the Gaza Strip and who are relying right now on that humanitarian help. And we, Israel, have not managed in all of these months to build any kind of system where yes, Hamas is not in the middle, meaning they take over the capabilities that we have consistently tried to allow in. There was a very short time period in 2023 where Israel stopped it completely because they wouldn't let anything in any knowledge about our hostages. And since then, we are the ones that are constantly saying, here's all of the help, the aid, let it get in. The United Nations international organizations. And at the end, it's Hamas who is running that. And this is the worst thing for the Palestinian population. Um, it's very challenging for me as an Israeli to be able to say right now that I think that it's better if Israel would do so, because that means that we would be putting Israeli capabilities into the different places in direct contact, and Hamas, the terror organization, will take advantage. They will go against it. They will try and stop that. So again, as I said before, there's no easy way about it, but at the end, somehow, that international aid needs to get to the people who need it. And at the end, it may be that Israel will have to do this directly. Indeed, of course, uh, the complexities demand innovation, demand thinking outside of the box, and to ensure uh, the protection of the forces, which is never an easy thing. Uh, General Kimmett, uh, what is your take on this? Obviously, uh, the United States dealt with uh, those kind of matters in a different fashion in Afghanistan and Iraq uh, during the various wars uh, fought there. Is there some recommendation that you could apply in this scenario? Are you talking about the specific scenario of the peace, the uh, ceasefire negotiations? Specifically, operationally speaking, on delivering aid to the people in Gaza rather than having Hamas exploit the weapon, uh, the humanitarian aid in order to uh, sustain and maintain uh, the affiliation of its various clans to this uh, terrorist organization. Well, no, I, I think the peer uh, process that we put up uh, the, the was an absolute failure on our part, both from a 
delivery point of view and actually uh, the ability to use a pier in high waters. That would seem to be the last uh, gasp of any kind of American direct intervention into providing supplies. Uh, we would do typically around the world uh, airborne supply drops of significant quantity. That's always been uh, a method of us being able to get equipment and supplies into area contested areas. But in this case, one would only wonder what Hamas would do um, if you started dropping those types of supplies. So as long as Hamas is given the authority by not only uh, the international community, but by others that uh, they uh, can interfere and interdict those supplies of any kind, I'm not sure there's anything the United States could do short of a forced entry operation. Indeed. Uh, General Shafir, at a time when uh, we're hearing additional reports of Hamas embedding its operational activities within humanitarian zones in a more direct fashion in order to execute uh, attacks against IDF uh, soldiers in the field and other activities, uh, what can the Air Force do to contribute in such a complex environment in order to ensure that the pressure, the military pressure on Hamas continues to be at a high intensity level? Well, let's think about uh, how, how this uh, humanitarian aid would take place. It would probably uh, cordon off uh, uh, quite a large area uh, where all the supplies would be and then um, fence it in and let the people come in uh, in small and smaller numbers and being checked at a checkpoint to see that they're not Hamas uh, or not carrying any weapons. They would come in, pick up the uh, supplies and go uh, and exit the other way. Um, but what happens when they do exit and they meet the Hamas forces that cannot be separated from the population. You don't know who it is, might not be carrying any weapons. Uh, this seems like uh, uh, somewhat of a futile uh, effort that uh, we've heard lately that was given to the uh, IDF. Um, this is, we've just reached the day after that we've been talking about for the last 11 months. What is going to happen in Gaza and the day after? Who is going to be in control? Um, unfortunately, we, we uh, um, during the last 20 years, had seen uh, that or taken a policy where the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And the enemy was the Palestinian Authority. Their enemy was Hamas, and therefore we, in a way, befriended Hamas uh, in all kinds of ways, both in Judea and Samaria and uh, um, in Gaza. And so uh, we are reaping the uh, uh, effects of that policy, and uh, this government is not able to switch the other way around and support the Palestinian Authority against Hamas, both in uh, um, uh, Judea and Samaria at the beginning, and then trying to bring them on board into Gaza with uh, Arab moderate countries. Uh, this particular government, because of the right-wing extremists it, within the government, is not able to reverse uh, this concept. And therefore, we are in a kind of a uh, uh, limbo situation where we cannot do the right thing and make the decisions due to political in, internal political implications that also have repercussions on the war in the north uh, and the rest of the uh, uh, war or, or confrontation with Iran. So um, sorry for taking this to a larger extent, but I think this is uh, where the limbo is and where we're at right now. Well, I, I do see a, a few parts a bit differently because I think that uh, airdrops is the only way to maintain a certain distance if you don't concentrate particularly the aid that is uh, delivered to the Gaza Strip and you spread out in a lot 
larger quantities, but uh, throughout a larger area, there is no capacity of one clan or another to seize control of everything, and each uh, family can take it by themselves. But, of course, we'll have to wait and see what uh, the defense establishment always, uh, ultimately will concoct uh, with regard to uh, the, the uh, Hamas uh, versus Palestinian Authority. Uh, this has to do with clans uh, that I, I think... Uh, we should still wait for the intelligence community to kind of figure out what is the right uh, construct uh, in order to engage within the very, very complex Palestinian street at a time when there is no support for either Hamas or the Palestinian Authority at this point in time in the Gaza Strip. And in Judea and Samaria, uh, many of those clans are up for grabs, and Iran knows it, and it spends a lot of money to try and buy those clans into its own ranks. But uh, we have really uh, not a lot of time left, and I'd like to hear all of you. Also, with regard to the Northern Front, preparations are being uh uh, conducted in various military maneuvers and, and exercises in order to uh, prepare potentially for a northern front escalating. Mr. Ogan, what can you tell us about that? Well, uh, neither side uh, or even three parties, if you include Iran, is anxious to escalate into a, a full-scale war. Um, and therefore, I will use my uh, brief time for two points. One, regarding the airdrops, um, it takes, it will take only one lucky shot by a Palestinian gunner to bring down a C-130 and all hell will uh, break loose. So it's better not to take this chance. The other thing is that in the Negev, in Israel's southern part, there are clans and gangs of Bedouins and others um, whose uh, specialty is extortion. And uh, Israel has been trying to force down a Western or Israeli template on on these uh, medieval or even pre-medieval customs, it won't uh, help it in Gaza. Well, uh, those medieval cu customs were still relevant less than uh, 70 years ago, uh, if we put things in context here in the Middle East. But uh, Miri, your take on the Northern Front? When we look right now at the challenges that we have, and we are in September of 2024, we in Israel have to be able to, as, as citizens, to be able to go back and live in our country. It's inconceivable to me that 11 months into this war, I cannot go to towns, villages, and cities. And that means that we need to be on the initiative, not letting Hezbollah, let alone the Islamic regime of Iran, define what happens up north. That is challenging news because it means taking a step. I am looking towards that direction, um, but you have to look at it overall because the implications are what you do both against Hamas in the Gaza Strip and again in Judea and Samaria. You can't do everything at once on the same level. I think that the North right now is the one that needs to be handled differently. There is some uh, discussion about uh, uh, after the holidays, intensifying the situation, re-diverting, of course, the center of gravity from the Gaza Strip towards Lebanon for the uh, sake of implementing Security Council Resolution 1701. Uh, but we'll have to wait and see for that. General Kemet, uh, at a time when the Iranians are not paying a price for the belligerent activities of its various proxies across the region, are we expected to see a continued effort by their proxies to uh, establish more gains for the sake of potentially uh, a recalibrated reality following the November elections in the United States? Well, in many ways, I think the first thing that's going to happen is they're going to size out who the president is at that point. Uh, we don't really know where Kamala Harris stands on Middle East issues. Uh, at this point, she has issued a number of platitudes, but nothing more. We haven't yet seen her policy. Uh, and so uh, I can only give you half the prediction. And half the prediction, if it's President Trump was reelected, I think you're going to see more of the same, a pretty hard line attitude towards the Iranians. So he will continue to press hard on them uh, in many different ways, but I don't think he's yet willing to start putting troops back on the ground to confront them. Uh, it is somewhat of a contradiction. President Trump wants to push hard on the Iranian threat, but he is an isolationist at heart, 
and we'll be pulling more troops back than putting troops into the region. Okay, well, General Sh uh, Shafir, you have the last minute. Uh, uh, from an Israeli Air Force perspective, preparing for the worst, is that a accurate assumption? Definitely so. I just spoke to uh, somebody who uh, I work with, who's an F-16 uh, pilot in reserve, and he spent uh, 22 days in August uh, flying in reserve. Uh, obviously, this kind of uh, 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 workload is not sustainable for a long time. So um, uh, the Air Force, unlike other branches, uh, can have this particular pilot and others in, in, in 48 hours of readiness. So the Air Force is uh, within several hours can deploy in full force and wherever it's needed. Um, so I expect and unfortunately, I don't see any other uh, capability that the uh, war with Hezbollah will take on either now or in a certain time because the people in the north will not go back unless Hezbollah is pushed into the Awali area and there's a, a, a strong buffer zone, a security zone, and Israel will be hard pressed by from internal point of view to uh, uh, provide such a defensive uh, maneuver. Uh, and we'll have to see, I guess, boots on the ground in Lebanon. This is in front of us and will have to be taken care of sooner or later and probably sooner. Thank you, General Shafir. And I would like to immediately also thank General Kimmet, Colonel Eisen and Mr. Oren for all of your insights and to thank all of you at home as well. And also to seize this opportunity to highlight that TV7 Israel is a 100% donation-based nonprofit ministry with all of our productions available free of charge. Therefore, if you're blessed by our programs, including uh, TV7's Israel at War update, which we of course are producing during this time of war and has accumulating uh, costs of its own, uh, if you're blessed by our productions, Please support us by going to our website at www.tv7israelnews.com where you can make a donation. So from here in Jerusalem, I'm Jonathan Hassan wishing you a Shabbat Shalom. TV7 Israel invites you to watch and hear some of the most knowledgeable experts, most of whom are took in creating policies shaping this region today. Join us for Jerusalem Studio.